Hello, this is Kevin Thompson. I'd like to welcome you to the Davis McGrath LLC IP webinar series for June 6, 2012. Today's topic is copyright infringement and damages. Today we're going to be going for about 30 minutes. Uh, the recording and slides will be posted at the address shown on your screen, which is uh, blog.davismcgrath.com forward slash webinars. You can also sign up for a webinar mailing list there. Uh, for those of you who need Illinois MCLE credit and you haven't already done so, uh, please send me your name and ARDC number. Uh, if you are watching the recording, you can also obtain credit for watching the recording. Uh, you would need to send me your name and ARDC number and when and how you saw the, the, the webinar. Uh, our next webinar is coming up on July 11th, 2012 from 12 to 12.30 Central Time on the um, topic of the new top-level Internet domains. Those are the new custom domains that are starting to come online and uh, we're going to be uh, discussing uh, the issues uh, relating to that as relates to trademarks and, and, and other uh, Internet uh, uh, law issues. So today we're going to be covering uh, copyright infringement and damages. We're going to cover the rights of the copyright owner, go through some uh, cases and talk about what exactly is copyright infringement and how infringement is determined. And then we'll look at the remedies for infringement. Uh, look at some cases dealing with injunctions, um, some cases dealing with damages, and as well as uh, costs and attorney's fees. And so um, at, at any point throughout the webinar, if you do have questions, uh, please feel free to ask uh, using the um, the software. It does provide a, a method for, for uh, raising a question, and I will certainly do my best to answer them as the uh, webinar goes along. Uh, we'll also have a time at the end for a question and action session as well. Uh, those of you that are viewing the, uh, the webinar uh, recording can also send, send me your questions by email. Um, this is a little more advanced uh, than, than to the basic copyright questions. Uh, we have covered uh, copyright uh, four times now in uh, the prior webinar series, and I've got links there uh, for our ba copyright basics, uh, online works, copyright registration and enforcement, copyright and fair use, and copyright ownership issues webinars. Uh, so for those of you that, that need more of a primer on the basics, uh, you can look at our prior webinars. So. Going into copyright, uh, the major issue here is uh, looking at the rights of the copyright owner, and uh, the, there are certain rights that you get uh, when you, when you do when you create a, a work. Uh, copyright exists from the moment of creation of a, a work of of original work of authorship, and you get the right to reproduce that work, the right to prepare derivative works, uh, the right to distribute copies the right to perform the work publicly, and also the right to display the work publicly. And also for sound recordings, uh, you also have the additional right to perform the work by means of a digital audio transmission. So what is copyright infringement? And that is an action by someone who is not the owner that usurps or interferes with one or more of the owner's exclusive rights. So uh, think of one of those rights there uh, on the prior page uh, with the uh, the right to distribute copies and so forth. If somebody uh, starts to distribute copies of, of a copyrighted work, that certainly would, would be considered infringement. But, you know, beyond that sort of dictionary definition, uh, the, the real question is how uh, do you go about proving that? What, what, what's, what are the steps that, that are taken by a court or, or other body that, that looks at uh, you know, whether or not there, there has been infringement? Um, first, uh, the question is whether or not there was copying. And uh, the courts will look at, uh, let's say, for example, uh, a defendant may admit to copying, so you might, might have an admission. But more often than not, the ha only thing you have is circumstantial evidence that can show um, that uh, there is uh, infringement going on. Uh, like they, they were able to look at, at, at the uh, work and they see a substantial similarity between uh, the work and uh, the, 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 the alleged infringing work. And uh, one of the things that the court will look at is whether or not w what was copying uh, is a, a protectable element. 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit more on this in, in detail, uh, but uh, it's important to look at it just making sure that what is protected by copyright was actually what was copied. Um, and so they, they will look to see whether or not there's substantial similarity, and then they will look to see whether or not the, the person could possibly have had access to uh, the original. Um, so you might see substantial similarity between two musical works. Uh, they, they might have a similar riff or, or other, you know, tonal qualities that, that would indicate that, uh, you know, that they certainly sound similar. But if you can't prove that uh, the, the, the second uh, composer actually had access or, or could listen to the original, um, then, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to show copying. So, um, you know, access is certainly one of the points where, um, you know, a lot of these cases uh, fall apart. If you, if you can't, you know, prove that they, they even saw the original, um, then it's, it's really hard to prove the copying occurred. And then the second part of that test is, did the copying amount to improper appropriation? Um, and they, this goes back into what I was talking about before, about protectable elements. Um, it's important to look to see, um, you know, just what was copied, uh, if if what was copied was um, um, you know the, the the heart of the work, or um, if it uh, uh, goes to um, a, a large amount of of the work was copied, um, you know that that certainly goes into it. This is also the part where um, you know somebody might try to raise a, a fair use claim, and um, uh, so I'm going to try to we'll talk about that in a little more detail as well, and we've also covered fair use uh, at significant length in one of our prior pro uh, webinars. So the case I wanted to talk about is uh, De Tocco versus Riordan, which is a case uh, from 2011 out of uh, the Southern District of New York, and it's a case between uh, uh, two authors as well as uh, some of the additional defendants include Disney, ABC, and 20th Century Fox. Uh, the plaintiff, De Tocco, is the author of a children's adventure books called The Hero Perseus and Atlas's Revenge. And the defendant, uh, uh, Riordan, Rick Riordan, is uh, the author of the Percy Jackson series of children's adventure novels. And uh, the other defendants are come in because they're also involved with the, the recent movie, uh, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. Um, these are, are both uh, books, series, uh, that, uh, you know, tie their, their characters in with Greek mythology. And so, um, you know, there's certainly some similarities between them. And obviously the plaintiff thought that there was enough similarity uh, to believe that Riordan had copied his works uh, when he created his own series, uh, you know, based on Greek mythology. Um, interestingly here, uh, uh, Riordan did not dispute access to the works. He certainly had read them, um, but uh, you know he you know honestly you know argued that he did not copy them. Um, and there are some tremendous um, you know similarities between them. Uh, but when you look at it, um, there wasn't anything copied that was protectable. Uh, they both involved young characters interacting with Greek gods, uh, but there was no, you know, that that particular element is not protectable. Um, you know, the Greek gods are, are, are not certainly protected by copyright by any stretch of the imagination. And, uh, you know, the original authorship, um, uh, you know, came out, you know, when, when the court examined it. Uh, both stories, uh, there was different narrative structure. Um, there was different characters. Um, one of the, um, uh, the, the the main character in both both uh, books has, has the name Percy. Uh, there were characters named for the hero Perseus, um, but the characters themselves are quite different. Um, one of them is is a more self confident, uh, adventuresome person in the in the the plaintiff's work, whereas um, the, uh, the the Percy character in the um, in the Riordan book is uh, you know he's got a, a learning disability he's um, got ADHD uh, he is uh, very much um, uh, a reluctant hero um, and um, 
you know, in terms of the narrative structure uh, and and in just general tone, uh, the the plaintiff's work involved a character who uh, entered the world of Greek mythology at night, whereas the defendant's books involved a modern day integration of Greek mythology into modern culture and settings. Um, so, for those of you that read the books, you might re remember that uh, in Percy Jackson, uh, Mount Olympus is now located on top of the Empire State Building. So, um, you know, this is certainly quite, uh, you know, different in terms of tone. And um, in this case, um, uh, the, the court granted summary judgment and, um, and uh, dismissed uh, the plaintiff's complaint. So, once you get through that, uh, you know, determining that there is an infringement, you know, the real question is then what are the remedies? Uh, you can certainly get injunctive relief. Um, you can get uh, the, the, uh, the goods impounded or destroyed. Uh, you can get the damages and profits of the infringer. And in certain cases, which we'll talk about, you can get your costs and attorney's fees as well as statutory damages. Uh, statutory damages are a substitute for uh, actual damages, especially in cases uh, when uh, it's difficult to prove that there was actual financial harm. And um, it, uh, the, the, the base is $750 to $30,000, but uh, in cases of willful infringement, it can be raised up to $150,000. And at the discretion of the judge or trier of fact, uh, an innocent infringement uh, that uh, you know the, the, the judge or, or trier of fact believes is truly innocent, uh, they could lower that down to $200. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is injunctions. Um, and uh, what you see most often is uh, somebody will bring a, a request for a preliminary injunction in a copyright case, and uh, that is a, a a, a sort of a mini trial that 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 takes place uh, very early on in the case, um, and the, the judge looks at it uh, at the, the merits of the case and believes that uh, the, the the plaintiff is likely to prevail at the end of the case. Uh, the judge may be inclined to grant the injunction early, you know, to prevent harm throughout the uh, the course of the proceeding, and you, you truly have to prove um, that it is uh, necessary and important uh, for, you know, an injunction to issue. And uh, for, for this, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, an interesting case from 2008, again out of the Southern District of New York, which is uh, Warner Brothers and J.K. Rowling versus RDR Books and Doe's 1 through 10. Um, there is a, a book that the defendants were publishing based on an online encyclopedia of Harry Potter lore uh, called The Lexicon. And so Warner Brothers and J.K. Rowling, the author, uh, sued to stop publication. Um, this is in the you know general category of books that would be considered a nonfiction reference guide to uh, you know the fictional world of Harry Potter. And um, what really got uh, uh, you know the defendant in trouble here is that there was a large amount of uh, direct quotation or paraphrasing of Rowling's original language in the in there. And um, you know, copied uh, too much of uh, what was there for its purpose of of being a um, a reference guide. That they certainly could have um, done more uh, to uh, eliminate uh, Rowling's original work um, in there. The um, the defendant tried to argue fair use. You know, tried to show it was transformative. That it was you know, admittedly, it was for a commercial gain. Um, you know, but the original work, you know, was a creative one. Um, but part of the problem here was that, you know, that this could have affected a, a market down the road for a later encyclopedia if, uh, you know, J.K. Rowling had actually decided to uh, come up with a, a um, uh, an encyclopedia of her own or authorized one. Um, you know, something like this could 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 hurt it. And uh, interestingly, um, you know, there's facts to show that uh, J.K. Rowling. Uh, was a fan of the online site. Uh, she certainly had no problems with with him publishing the online encyclopedia of uh, the lexicon, but uh, so certainly you know did not consent and objected to you know turning around and, and profiting from that online encyclopedia by by trying to publish a book 
which essentially was a, uh, uh, a recasting of that online encyclopedia into book form. And so uh, that they requested a, a preliminary injunction. Uh, the the court looked at it, um, and um, uh, there's a there's a, a four factor test that uh, court must go through. One is that they must suffer an irreparable injury, and second is that the remedies available at law, such as monetary damages, are inadequate. Uh, the third is that considering the balance of hardships um, that uh, a remedy is uh, is warranted, you know, the balancing the, the harm to the plaintiff versus the harm to the defendant, that, you know, the harm should, you know, issue in, in favor of, uh, of the injunction, and that, uh, you know, the public interest would not be deserved, you know, by entering such this injunction. And so those are the four factors. And in this, um, you know, they looked at it and, and said it was certainly, you know, Harm harm them if if the book is um, is published. A reparable injury is is usually presumed in these types of copyright cases, but it's it, it's a mere presumption; it can be rebutted. Um, and um, uh, if the injunction would not be issued, uh, you know this book would be published and and you know be in the hands of consumers and you know could you know impact the marketplace. And so um, you know just merely having it out there. Uh, you know, would be a, a tremendous damage, and uh, you know, monetary damages would not be would not be helpful. And so, uh, you know, the balance of hardships, you know, weighed in favor of the injunction, and um, uh, the injunction was issued. So it's a really interesting case. The case itself is kind of long; it's about thirty pages, uh, and it's it's quite interesting reading, especially when they go through the the sections of the case, you know, talking about fair use. And uh, you know the amount of copying and and so forth, uh, you know. But we're talking about it here mainly for the purpose of talking about the injunction. Uh, the next uh, potential remedy is uh, impoundment or destruction. Um, you know this happens uh, a lot uh, if there are, um, let's say, uh, uh, illegal copies of, especially with uh, books or. Uh, or other items uh, that they could be easily sold or, or distributed in commerce. Um, you know, they'll, they'll have, uh, you know, the, the books will need to be destroyed or, you know, the clothing will be seized and shredded or um, or otherwise, you know, turned over, you know, for, for further disposition by, by, by the plaintiff. Um, and it should be noted that registration is a prerequisite for certain remedies for infringement. Um, and I've put the section here for Section 412. It's, it's an important uh, uh, section of the Copyright Act um, you know, when it comes to damages. And it's, since it's not with the regular damages section, which is in this 500 section, a lot of people overlook it. Uh, but it's, it's an important one. Uh, because if you don't have a registration, um, that uh, took place before the infringement occurred or uh, within three months of original first publication, uh, you're not eligible for statutory damages or attorney's fees. And uh, that's sort of a, a, an incentive for registration uh, that's built into the act. Um, so you can still bring a, bring a case for, for an infringement that occurred after, uh, or, or let, let's say, you know, the infringement occurred and then you sought a registration, you can still bring a case. And in fact, you have to register the mark or at least apply before you can, you know, bring your case in federal court. But it would certainly limit the, the amount of remedies that you had available. Uh, you could still try to get an injunction. You could try to get impoundment. You could try to get uh, the, um, you know, their actual damages. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to get statutory damages or attorney's fees in that case. So uh, Section 504 of the Act deals with uh, damages and profits, um, and uh, you, uh, you're either liable for the copyright owner's actual damages or profits uh, of the infringer that are provided by a, a section below, Section B, or statutory damages which we've already talked about a little bit. Um, so here's that side of Section B, um, and uh, they're entitled to get the, the profits of the infringement that are attributable to the infringement. And, um, 
you know, goes to establish the, the infringing pro, infringer's profits by showing proof of the infringer's gross revenue, and then the infringer will be required to prove, you know, their expenses and, uh, you know, elements of cost or, or elements of profits that are attributable to other factors. So, like, if they've got a, a large amount of profit, but they can show uh, that only some of it related to this, this particular work, uh, then, uh, you know, they could get that, you know, actual damages amount reduced. Statutory damages, uh, which we've talked about briefly, uh, 750 to $30,000, uh, and then uh, up to $150,000 in the case of willful infringement. Um, you know, those are certainly an incentive, again, built into the act as, uh, as an incentive for a copyright owner to, to bring this case, uh, you know, such that, um, you know, they may not otherwise, uh, you know, bring it if, you know, they were only harmed like for $100 or something in that case, but, you know, there's a chance that, that they might get a, a large, you know, award of, you know, potentially up to $150,000, um, you know, then, you know, that certainly would be an incentive. Another incentive for, for bringing a case could be the ability to recover your costs and attorney's fees, you know, if you're able to prove infringement. Um, and so, um, because, I mean, it's a certainly expensive to bring litigation, and, um, it, and you know, by no means is uh, the attorney's fees required. Uh, the court, you know, in its discretion may not award it. Uh, but it's it's a certainly uh, more often than not that uh, costs will, will be assessed. Um, here's an interesting case uh, that I want to talk about, which is uh, Range Rug Music versus East Coast Foods, which came out of the Ninth Circuit very recently here in 2012. Uh, the actual decision came down in February. Um, and this is a, a suit between uh, the recording industry uh, the, the first uh, name plaintiff is Range Road Music, but also involved in the case is Sony, Williamson Music, um, Universal Music, and, and a number of other uh, plaintiffs. And then uh, East Coast Foods is a um, company that owned a, a restaurant and lounge, and um, as well as some of the other defendants include um, the owner of the liquor license and uh, some of the other people involved in, um, you know, the ownership or, or administration of, of the particular um, case. Um, th this is a Ninth Circuit case. Uh, it's on appeal uh, to the Ninth Circuit uh, from, uh, I believe, in California. Um, yes, the uh, central, from the Central District of California is the original case. Um, and it, it's an interesting this fact pattern here. Uh, the restaurant had, uh, for a number of years, um, had been requested by uh, the um, ASCAP, which is the company that deals with uh, licenses uh, for, you know, public performance of music. You know, like if you're owner of a bar and you want to have live or recorded music at your place, you need an ASCAP license to, to cover uh, those performances. And they've been requested for a number of years to get a license, and they simply refused for years. And so finally, uh, th uh, you know, the ASCAP sent an investigator in to uh, to review what was going on there, and uh, they uh, the investigator was able to determine that eight different songs had been performed, uh, you know, eight, eight, eight recognizable copyrighted works, and so those are the ones that they sued over. And at the district court level, uh, the district court entered summary judgment and awarded statutory damages in the amount of $4,500 per song, which worked out to $36,000 in statutory damages. And then uh, the kicker here was, in terms of attorney's fees and costs, uh, the court awarded $162,728.22. Um, you know, not small change here. It's certainly a large award. And uh, so they, they appealed on a number of bases. One of them is appealing the amount of attorney's fees. And um, another was a um, uh, basis for the appeal was uh, challenging, uh, you know, the, the nature of the investigator and, you know, the, the, the investigator's conduct. And uh, it's, it's an interesting case from, from that point of view uh, in the sense that uh, the, uh, the investigator was able to, uh, you know, 
recollect you know what songs had been performed certainly by no means was that person uh an expert uh in in songs um you know but you know no more so than somebody who uh you know as the court noted uh you know would have um you know participated in a um a music contest or you know something else you know would try to name that tune uh so, so certainly by no means does somebody need to be an expert and it didn't hurt that uh you know the band announced the name of some of the songs before they performed them uh so you know the you know, the person just simply wrote down, you know, what songs they were. And also at one point they, they played some recorded music. They had a CD player just out there connected to some speakers. And uh, the, the agent was able to go over and look at the CD player and see the CD case sitting next to the player and was able to write down the names of the songs that uh, were, were being played. Uh, so, you know, that's so sort of an interesting element. But here, you know, talking about attorney's fees, um, you know, the court looked at it and said it was justified because uh, there was a lot of um, uh, it, it, back and forth between the parties. The uh, the defendant had uh, tried to uh, hide its corporate structure and had, uh, you know, aggressively, you know, defended the case. And so, um, you know, the award of attorney's fees and costs was reasonable under the circumstances. So uh, it's interesting, you know, that, that um, you know, the you know, that they could get, uh, you know, a, a large award such as that, uh, you know, even though only $36,000 in actual, dam in actual st statutory damages. Um, it's also a, a good case of showing, um, you know, the differences between, you know, statutory damages and actual damages, you know, because their actual damages were probably quite small uh, compared uh, to $4,500 per song. Um, you know, they may have been out uh, the license fee or, um, you know, some some other uh, much smaller amount uh, by, by simply not uh, bringing uh, the, uh, the, the case uh, in, in that particular fashion. So, um, you know, so, so similarly, um, you know, the other cases we've talked about, you know, Warner Brothers uh, versus RDR Books, you know. Um, you know, if it had gotten to that point, I believe it was actually, um, you know, settled after this. Um, so uh, they, um, um, you know, they actually they, they did award statutory damage in the amount of uh, $750 for each novel. And, um, you know, like they awarded $6,750 in that case. And, um, you know, the uh, De Toco case obviously uh, didn't get to that point because uh, you know they, they weren't able to find that any infringement had occurred. So um, I think this is probably a good point uh, to uh, turn this over for questions. If anybody has questions, uh, we can certainly talk about them. Again, the uh, software provides a, a method for, for uh, asking questions. Just go ahead and uh, put your question in using the software, and um, I will uh, do my best to answer them. Um, if you think of something later, um, you, or if you're watching the recording, you, know, you can always email me at the address shown on your screen, which is kthompson at davismcgrath.com. So are there any questions? Well, I'm not seeing any questions right now, so I would like to uh, thank everybody for attending. I'd like to remind you that our next webinar is coming up on July 11th, 2012, again from 12 to 12.30, on the topic of the new top-level Internet domains that are coming out, uh, the ones that ICANN are just starting to proceed. Uh, they originally sh all should have been announced uh, in uh, early May, and now uh, supposedly will be announced next week, July th sorry, June 13th. We'll see whether or not that they meet that release date, but they, they, hopefully they will do, they will do that, and then we'll, we'll be able to talk about uh, you know the new top level domains and you know its impact on trademarks and so forth. Um, I'd like to say that this is probably the last of our uh, copyright related um, uh, webinars that's going to be on an introductory level. Uh, our next ones that we'll do on copyright will take a slightly more advanced. Um, 
you know, state. We certainly have covered the basics of, of copyright law through the last four webinars uh, dealing with copyright. So again, uh, those of you who uh, would like to Illinois MC Elite credit, if you have not already done so, please provide me with your name and ARDC number by email and how you viewed the webinar. Um, again, the address for, uh, for our webinars is blog.davismcgrath.com forward slash webinars uh, where you can see the recordings. Uh, the recordings are also available as uh, a video podcast in iTunes and are also available on YouTube. So I'd like to thank you all for attending. Have a great day.